Little Blue Book, page 104. Little Blue Book, page 104. 104. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me Neath the healing, cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Let's all stand I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, for uh, this Lord's Day. I pray that you bless every one of us here, Lord, and I pray that we uh, please you in what we do, and I pray that you open our hearts to change if it need be today, Lord, that we can go out in our community and, and make it a better place and shine a light to your Son, Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. 213. Two, one, three, two, thirteen. Well, 
and all sorrow has drifted away. I'll be standing at the portals when the gates open wide at the close of life's long dreary day. I'll meet you in the morning with a hat. sit down by the river and with rapture old acquaintance renew you'll know me in the morning by the smiles that I wear when I meet you in the morning in the city that is built for square I will meet you in the morning in the sweet by and by And exchange the old cross for a crown There will be no disappointment and nobody shall die In that land where life's sun goeth down I'll meet you in the morning with the how do sit down by the river and with rapture old acquaintance renew you'll know me in the morning by the smiles that I wear when I meet you in the morning in the city that is built for square I will meet you in the morning at the end of the way On the streets of that city of gold Where we all can be together and be happy for us While the years and the ages shall roll I'll meet you in the morning with a high sit down by the river and with rapture old acquaintance renew you'll know me in the morning by the smiles that I wear when I meet you in the morning in the city that is built for square One more. We got a dinosaur down there. Sound like. Hopefully not the tea. Page 160. 160. <laughs> <laughs> On George.
Good morning. It, uh, it is a beautiful morning out. I uh, almost tempted to uh, take a picture of the sunrise this morning. It was just so beautiful. And uh, this week marks the last full week of normalcy in our lives a year ago. Because it's a year ago to uh, next Sunday that the virus became, as I'm just going to say, full-blown. And we were encouraged safer at home. Spring break's what started it. And if you look at the board over there, Gary, we haven't updated the board in a year. That was the last Sunday school attendance uh, that we had was, would be next week, a year ago. Boy, we've had a lot of stuff happen in that year, haven't we? And, and we're finally starting to move back, I pray, to some, some sense of normalcy, but I don't know what's normal anymore is, is almost where I'm at. Uh, a couple, couple announcements I want to share with you. Please do not forget, along with normalcy and all of that, next Sunday is time change. Spring forward. Spring forward. We need to move our clocks ahead. If you get here uh, next week and don't change your clock, there probably will not be anybody here or we will be on our way out. We'll wave at you as you leave and, and we'll still take your offering though, okay? Um, but anyway, please remember spring forward next Sunday and then the next uh, Saturday is going to be spring. We're almost on spring and Easter is four weeks from today. That's the one I'm still trying to wrap my arms around, or, or my mind is spring being, uh, uh, or Easter being one month away. Now, with all of, of, of this, uh, this time change in spring, we come to our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which is our, our home missions or North American missions offering next Sunday night. We will be watching the video. Out on the, on the table in the foyer, there are prayer guides that you may start the week of prayer starts this week uh today and goes through next sunday we highlight a different missionary each day prayer guides are out there as well as the offering envelope uh our church goal is 750 dollars. this money uh does go toward the support of our north american missionaries and we'll be highlighting some of those in the video uh next week um to my knowledge, just kind of in way of a public service announcement, the Boyle ban is still in effect. I've heard no different. I ran a glass of water here in the church this morning and have it sitting on the counter, and it still looks crystal clear. So I don't know what kind of uh, germs, amoeba, or whatever's floating around in there, but they encourage you to still... Uh, boil your water for uh, one minute before drinking it. And then we're, we're still not sure when Sunday school Bible study is going to start back. We're monitoring everything going on in the state of Oklahoma, Haskell counties, the numbers like that. You have been interested in a Bible study, so Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. in Fellowship Hall, uh, we'll be starting a Bible study over the book of John. Book of John, Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. If you are interested in that, I want to encourage you to come up. I am looking at an evening during the week for those that can't make it during the day. I've just not been able to uh, get a time set on that yet, so bear with me as we, uh, as we approach that. Anyway, Tuesday, 10 a.m., Fellowship Hall. I want to encourage you to be up. Yes? Yes. Yes, if you write a check for the North American Mission offering, don't write it to Annie Armstrong. Don't write it to North American Mission Board. Uh, write it to Lee Choir Baptist Church. Put it in an envelope or mark it in the memo. Uh, A-A-E-O. Annie Armstrong Easter offering and Greta will make sure that it gets counted and sent toward that. With this time of the year, Easter on the horizon, it's kind of like Christmas for a preacher. We're going to look at Easter. Easter and Christmas are my favorite times of the year at church. 
because I get to preach on two of my favorite topics, the birth of Christ at Christmas and the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. You can't just say crucifixion. You have to say the resurrection with that also. So I'm going to take the next three Sundays, and, and on Sunday mornings, we are going to look at the crucifixion of, uh, of Christ, and then uh, Sunday evenings, we'll take a couple of evenings, look at the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ starting tonight. Next Sunday night will be the video, and then the next Sunday night we'll pick back up with the resurrection. And hallelujah, Sunday morning on Easter Sunday, how can we not celebrate the resurrection of Christ, kind of the, the, the grand culmination to it. Now, with that, in my preparation for, for Easter, we're, we're going to, to look at, at, I want to call it a journey to the cross, but, but that, that is kind of, that title has been used in, in several occasions, so it is the journey to the cross, and, and we'll, we're going to look today about, about the cross getting to the cross, and then we'll look at, uh, at at what happened along the way to the cross, and then I'm still working on the other two after that. So you got to bear with me. If I plan too far ahead, I forget where I leave my notes, and uh, it causes problems. It causes problems. But we're going to look at, th it, it, I say three, it's actually four scripture today, but the pivotal scripture I want to look at is Matthew 20. Chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Matthew 17. Well, actually, that's not right. It's Matthew 17. Uh, yeah. No, I'll get it right here in a minute because there's, there's three instances. Matthew 20, verses 17 to 19. And I even have my notes in front of me now. That ought to be frightening to you. When we look at, at, at Matthew 20... In these, in these few verses, this is, is also a parallel to what Luke wrote uh, about his recording of, of Jesus' prediction of his, of his death for the third time in Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Now, I've picked these two texts for, for an obvious reason that I'll, I'll, I'll get to. Well, I'll just tell you, it is the most descriptive of what is getting ready to happen with Jesus. He gives his disciples more information on, 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 the, on the death, the crucifixion in Luke and in Matthew than he does in the other occurrences. What do I mean by the other occurrences? You remember when Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi, pulled away from the crowd, and, and this was, was really a, a turning point in Jesus' ministry because from that point on, Luke says in, in Luke 9, he made his way, he set his face steadfastly to go toward Jerusalem. This is moving toward the end of Jesus' ministry. One of the things that you have to notice in reading the Gospels is, is yes, chrono chronology is there, but we want to take and, and put those last few chapters as the last few days in Jesus' life. And that's actually not true because in Luke chapter 9, that's over the halfway point of Jesus' ministry. In John, actually when you get to John chapter 10, that's over the halfway point and moving toward the end of Jesus' ministry, about two-thirds of the way through actually. When you look into Matthew at chapter 16, that does mark the halfway point that is there. What is it that, that makes Jesus turn his face toward Jerusalem? Well, in Matthew 16, when you look at it, it's a question that Jesus asked them. Who do you say that I am? Now, and, and, and boy, there's a, a, a good sermon, and, and many have been preached from that, but there's a sermon in itself on who do we say that Jesus is. But it's important because Jesus now is, is fully revealing himself as Messiah. He's told them before, not yet, you can't, don't. Uh, but in moving toward Jerusalem, he's preparing them, and he's saying, you know, for you to understand the death, burial, and resurrection, you have to understand something. Who am I? Who am I? I had a, had a wonderful conversation this week with, with an individual. Uh, it was a child about, about Jesus' questions they're asking. And, and with child evangelism, there's always that question, do they understand? 
And for a child that is born and reared in a Christian home, in a Christian environment, with Christian parents, aunts, uncles, they understand the terminology. Who is Jesus? Well, he's the Son of God. Who is Jesus? He died on a cross for my sins, put in a grave, rose again on the third day, seen by many, ascended to heaven. Yes, that is Jesus. But then the question needs to be asked, who is Jesus? And, 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 and this, this, this child gave an answer that was so amazing because he came to a point of salvation knowing who Jesus was, but something greater than that, and that was the realization of his lostness. You know, even the demons know who Jesus is, and they'll proclaim him, but not as their Savior and Lord, but as the Son of God. So when you come to that lostness, you have that understanding and that grip, who is Jesus, because you realize you are separated from God because of sin and will spend an eternity in hell. That's a pretty good concept for a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old child, I would say, because I know a lot of adults that don't get that. But Jesus asked him that question, who do you say that I am? So as we get ready for Easter, and if I squeak today, I'm sorry, I still have this head cold that's going on. And one of these days, maybe dynamite up each nostril or blow it loose, I don't know. But just bear with me. So if I squeak, it's because I'm excited and, and all the sinus stuff. Anyway, so as we prepare for Easter this year, let me ask you something. Who do you say that he is? Because when Jesus comes back, and he will come back, the question going to be answered by, or asked by God, what did you do with my son? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? How does it get written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You have to come to the realization that Jesus is God's son. He's your Savior, and without him and the forgiveness of your sins, you're lost. So we ask the question today, who is Jesus? Because after this, after he asks this question, Jesus reveals for the first time, something. In verse 21 of chapter 16, he says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed and raised on the third day. So he, he comes back from Caesarea Philippi, goes back around the area of the Sea of Galilee, and then another interesting event happens. He takes Peter, James, and John with him six days after, after he asks who, the, who they say that Jesus is. He takes Peter, James, and John up with him to the mountain, and, and, and that's where the transfiguration happens. The transfiguration happens, and, and, and Jesus is seen conversing with, with Elijah, with Moses. Peter says, is it good for us to be here? Should we make a tabernacle? And, and then they're gone. They come down from the mountain. Jesus has uh, the encounter with his disciples and the man who has a son who is demon-possessed, the epileptic. Some would say, throwing himself in the fire. Jesus cast out the demon, uh, and, and, and then the disciples, they, they move on from there. Peter finds a coin in the fish's mouth. Uh, disciples argue about who is the greatest there. But back in chapter 17, um, in, in verses 22 and 23, after he cast out the demon, he says this, while they were staying in Galilee, in that area, he said, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. So we see that, that Jesus reveals the first time, the, the, the first time about his death, and they don't understand. The second time, they're saddened by this, but then the third time, right before Jesus makes his triumphal entry, into Jerusalem, Jesus reveals now for the third time what is getting ready to happen. Well, what's getting ready to happen? And, and, and I'm going to read Matthew 20 and Luke also because of what's in here. He says, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, We are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests, 
the scribes, they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Parallel passage on this in, in Luke as, as, he, as he gives his description of this in chapter 18, verses 31 to 34. He says, he took the 12 aside to them, still on the road to Jerusalem, took them aside and he said, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and all the things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. He will be delivered to the Gentiles, be mocked, insulted, spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. So we see with, 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 with these two encounters that Jesus has a recording of him telling about his death, burial, and resurrection. Some significance that's here. This is the third and the last time he will tell them this. He's taking them to Jerusalem. Now in Matthew 20, we know that that, that is where he did that in Matthew 21, is that grand triumphal entry, that parade that, that Jesus comes to town. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Jesus is known by the people. Messiah has come. Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. Son of David. The people cry out. Pharisees say, make him stop. And Jesus said, do you not know that even the rocks would cry out? Even if I silence them? So we see in Matthew 20, he's telling them, we're going to Jerusalem and you need to get ready. Here's what's going to happen. And, and you know, I, I picture this. And, and reading one of the commentaries yesterday, I hadn't realized this. Going to Jerusalem, it was a celebration of the Passover. I just finished reading Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and that Passover feast that is given, and how long that it lasts, and why it's so important that as Jesus was going to Jerusalem to be crucified, so were many, many, many other people going to Jerusalem to prepare to celebrate the Passover. And then the feast of unleavened bread that would last for that week that was there. And then 49 days after the Passover, they would celebrate the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost that was there. The people were going. They had to go find a place to live for that time that they were there, a place to stay. They had to make preparations to get the lamb if they were coming from a distance, to make sure that their offering was, was right and would be acceptable to God. So as Jesus is going, he's not traveling just with 12 disciples, apostles. There's many other people that are on the road at this time. And Jesus pulls them aside. I like to think that road, that, that, that there's many people that are traveling on the dust is stirring up. And sometimes you just got to pull over and get a breath of fresh air. And Jesus pulling them off the side of the road and possibly under, under a shade tree, maybe a fig tree for some shade, a little bit of water to catch their breath and let the crowd get ahead. And then they'll merge back on and continue to Jerusalem. And, and, and he pulls them aside to tell them, what's getting ready to happen. They've heard this twice already, that the Son of Man is, is going to be handed over. But listen to the description that, that Luke and that uh, uh, Matthew both give about this event. He says, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. And now he names it out. The chief priests, the scribes, will condemn him to death. Now, we see where Luke goes on and says, the prophets, what they have said is going to be fulfilled. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, specifically mentions this very thing of the crucifixion that we're talking about. So he says what, what the prophets have said concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. He will be delivered. And Luke says to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted. Interesting thing between Matthew and Luke. Matthew is writing to not a Gentile crowd. Matthew is writing to a Jewish crowd. Luke, on the other hand, is writing to a Gentile crowd. Those are the non-Jews. Those are the ones that, that, that uh, would not be looked upon 
But he's saying between the two authors that are here, Matthew is saying it's going to be the leaders of our own people that are going to crucify him. They're going to take him. They're going to, to take him, and then they are going to, he's, he will be betrayed. <laughs> I love this, the son of man will be betrayed. Who betrays him? Judas, one of his own. But he will be betrayed to the chief priests, the scribes. They'll condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles who will mock, scourge, crucify. Because a good Jew, he couldn't get his hands dirty doing that, could he? No, we wouldn't want that. So we can blame it on the Romans at that time, the Gentiles that were there. Luke goes on to say he'll be delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, insulted. And he adds something that Matthew doesn't, and spit upon. You guys ever been spit on? I think that's one of the most degrading things for an individual. And as the Romans spit on him during this mock trial phase of Pilate, during this time before he was to be handed over for crucifixion, when he was being scourged, they came by. They struck him open-handedly. They spit on him. Prophesy, who hit you? Who hit you? So we see with this, everything that Matthew, everything that Luke said, everything that Mark wrote about, it happened. This was the actual recordings that were there. On the way to Jerusalem. You know, as, and, and Jesus is preparing them for what's going to happen. And I wonder, could you really prepare them? Well, when I look at all of, of, of these writings, and particularly Luke and Matthew's account, I notice three or four things that comes out of it. And as we get ready for this Easter season, Jesus preparing his disciples for what is lying ahead, we see a couple of things. The first thing we see is the message. What is the message? The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest, to the scribes. He will be betrayed and handed over. He will be betrayed by one of his own. And one of his own being Judas Iscariot, the one who for the price of, of, of silver was willing to, to betray. But you know, in reading one of the commentaries, and I've read a, a couple of books on this also, we, we are quick to blame Judas and the authors, the commentators will say. But you know, Judas and, and, and those that are around him, think about this crowd as he came in on that good, or on Monday, or excuse me, Sunday, as he made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They were ready. They were looking for an earthly king. They were looking for deliverance from the Roman bondage. They were looking for freedom. They were ready for someone to come in and establish. That was their idea of who Messiah was. And Jesus repeat, repeatedly told them, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. And yet they were looking for the earthly kingdom that was there. And Judas, who had witnessed all of these things, as Jesus made his way toward Jerusalem, he gave the cost of discipleship. And he said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Let a man die to himself. And it's interesting because it says after that, the gospel writers, many left him from that time on. They left. They weren't willing to pay the price. And Jesus, who was, who was so famous because of his healings, because of his teachings, because of his dealings with the, with the chief priests, the scribes, because of all of these things, he was a very popular person. But when push came to shove, that, that's not what they wanted. That's not what they expected. And, and some will say that Judas wanted to force Jesus' hand, to force his hand. In, in, if I betray him, he'll have to come forward. He'll have to take that stand. He'll have to bring his armies. And we see that that is not what happened. That's not what happened. Where on the other hand, he betrayed him and the remorse of Judas was so much that he went out and killed himself, hung himself. But the message is a message of betrayal. The message is one of, of an apprehension of the garden. What happened in the garden? You know, we, we, we look at the garden and we see those three heartfelt, earnest prayers of Jesus. Father, take this cup from me. Not my will, but thine. Can you not tarry one hour? Father, 
Take this, Abba, Father, take this bitter cup from me. Not my will, but thine. They're still sleeping. He goes back and prays a third time and comes back and says, Are you still sleeping? Arise, your captor is at hand. Who are you looking for? Jesus. Judas, would you betray me with a kiss? Peter lops off the ear. But don't, don't miss in the garden. Yes, the prayer was there. The betrayal happened, but there was also an apprehension in the garden. We see Jesus. Now, I want you to think about what Jesus just said. The Son of Man will be betrayed and handed over to the chief priests, to the scribes, those Jewish leaders. He is handed over by one of his own. He's handed over to the scribes, the Pharisees. He's delivered to them, but it's the apprehension by Herod's soldiers. Now, this is not Pilate's soldiers. This is Herod's soldiers. Herod's soldiers are the ones that were, the, the or not the palace guards, but the temple guards. They went out to get Jesus. So I want you to see in here, you see the fulfillment of the chief priests, the scribes, one of his own, and the Gentiles. Herod's soldiers were Gentiles also. But you see Gentiles later on. We see where Jesus is found guilty by the chief priest and the scribes, the very one he's delivered to. And it's kind of amusing because they have all these witnesses come up and they can't even agree on what they're saying. And someone said, he said if this temple would, took, would be tore down. He would rebuild it in three days. Blasphemy, how could he say this? And that's the charge that they found him on. And then they handed him over to Pilate to be sentenced. We see he was betrayed, apprehended, delivered, and now handed over to Pilate, the Gentile himself, who would bring the, the verdict that the, the Jews could not. They could not condemn a man to death and kill him. They could condemn him to death. You know, it's really kind of funny, too, because for blasphemy, when you read the Old Testament law, for blasphemy, they were to take you out and stone you. To stone you. And it was the Jewish people that would stone you. But yet they bring Jesus to Pilate and say, we found this man guilty. He says, you see to it. He said, we can't. In Jewish law, uh, uh, we see Roman law would trump Jewish law that was there. That was there. So they couldn't. They knew they couldn't without getting in trouble themselves. They took him to Pilate. The message that is there is Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I will be betrayed. I will be handed over. I will be apprehended. I will be sentenced while I'm there. But after that message, we see the mandate that came down. What was the mandate? You are guilty of blasphemy. Therefore, you must die. The kangaroo court of the Sanhedrin that was made up of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who made up the priests and the chief priests, we see that they are the ones that rendered that. The mandate is you must die. And Jesus said, they will condemn him to death. He goes to Pilate. Pilate can't find anything wrong with him. He says, I find nothing wrong with this man. And they, they cry out, crucify him. And I said, I'll tell you what, it's, it's appropriate for me once a year to hand you over someone. How about I give you Jesus? They said, no, give us Barabbas, the man who was guilty uh, they said insurrection. <laughs> we know what that is. We've heard that in the news ever since the 5th of January, haven't we? Insurrection against the government. That's what Barabbas was. Insurrection against the government killing Roman soldiers. They'd rather have a murderer go free than they would the son of God. Pilate moves on and says, but I find nothing wrong with him. He said, I wash my hands of this man's blood. And they, they say, his blood be upon us and our descendants. So Pilate took the mandate, had him, had him scourged. And in that scourging, he was mocked. He was hit. He was spit upon. A purple robe was put upon him. A crown of thorns Hit with the reed, hit with the open hand. So, Messiah, prophesy who hit you, who hit you. And they ripped it off and gave him back to Pilate. And Pilate 
said then, guilty, guilty you want, guilty he shall be. And the mandate was that he would be crucified. And we know that from that point, Jesus walked that road, the Via Dolorosa, the road of the cross, carrying his cross as far as he could. The message was given that I would be, he would be handed over. The mandate was given that he would be beat, he would be uh, mocked, he would be uh, scourged, he would be scoffed at, he would be spit upon to the point of his crucifixion. You will die. He made it outside of town and he was crucified. All the gospels say there he was crucified. They nailed him to the cross. For six hours he was suspended between heaven and earth. And not only, you know, when we look at the mocking of, of the soldiers, the mocking of those that, that, that were the Gentiles, there's a mocking that goes even beyond this. It's so sad. That's the mocking of the ones who came by, wagging their heads saying, he saved others himself he could not save. The mocking that was there, those ones that were mocking, could they have possibly been the very ones just earlier in the week, Hosanna, Hosanna, praising him as being the Messiah. And now they shake their heads saying, he saved others himself he could not save. Oh, but then you get the, then you get the religious elite, the leaders that come by, and they want to add to it. They wanted to say, if you're the son of God, come down from there. You've got, if you're the son of God, you've got all these angels. And something you need to realize is Jesus could have called those angels all the way back in the garden. Did he not tell people, uh, Peter, do I not have 12 legion of angels that I can call upon? Put your sword back. Oh, but there was the scoffing. <laughs> you, the son of God, look at you. Bloody, bruised, meat hanging off of you from the scourging. Bleeding where the crown is on your head. And you call yourself the son of God? And look, you saved all these others. You healed the blind. You caused the deaf to hear, the mute to talk. You, you dissolved the leprosy. You cast out the demons. Why, you even took the widow of Nain and raised her son. And you took Jairus' daughter and you raised her from the dead. You took... You took um, you ever had one of those mind blanks? I just had one. Who was it he raised from the dead? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Thank you. He raised Lazarus from the dead who had been in the grave. How long? One day? Two days? Three days? No. Four days. You raised him. And look, you're sitting here hanging. What kind of a Messiah is that? And we sit here and say, oh, I would never do that. And I think sometimes we do it every day. If, you're the, if you are God, if you are Messiah, then heal my loved one. Then, then get me out of this debt that I am in. Then restore my relationship with my spouse. Bring them back to me. Bring my child who is wayward back to me. If you're the son of God, and we need to understand something, Jesus is not a man to bargain with. The bargaining days are over with. And you know, it kind of goes back to that original question. Who do you say that I am? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then what was the next one? It is finished. And he gave up the ghost. He died. And... They came to break the legs to hurry the death of those on the cross. The two thieves and Jesus, when they came to Jesus, he was already died. And the soldier thrust a spear into his side and blood and water flowed. Indicative of he was dead. And they took Jesus and they put him in a tomb. And the, and the religious elite, the leader, still remembered he said... In three days I'll rise. And they went to Pilate. And Pilate said, make the grave as secure as you can. Here's you a couple guards. They put the seal on it and, and made it secure. But you know, there's a message, there's a mandate, and there's a miracle. And what is that miracle? He lives. He lives. Because on that third morning, 
the third day, on the morning of the third day, the ground shook, the stone was rolled away. And by the way, I want to reiterate again, when you look at the writing in the, in the original languages of, of that stone being rolled away, we want to think that it was uphill, rolled downhill, and was made secure. May I tell you, it's not. When you look at how that is written, that stone was forced from in front of that tomb. It wasn't rolled. It was blown away. Why? Because Jesus is that powerful? Yeah. Because the grave couldn't keep him. And I'm thinking just Jesus is like, you really think so? And that stone was gone. And I guarantee you, if I'd have been one of those soldiers there, I'd have been scared to death too. I would have been shaking. I would have been petrified. I would have been like a, like, like a dead man right there. And he lives. And we have all the, the, the recorded occurrences of Jesus being seen alive and we see with that message with that mandate with that miracle of jesus being alive we see jesus fulfilling the very words that he said i have to go we have to go to jerusalem and the son of man will be handed over will be handed over will be betrayed to the chief priests the scribes to the gentiles and 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 they will mock and scourge and spit crucify him, and the third day will rise again. What Jesus said would happen is going to happen. What's the takeaway from all of this? The takeaway, I think, is this. If Jesus said it, it's going to happen. Now, what's the importance of that? Jesus not only said, I got to go to Jerusalem, but he also said, let not your heart be troubled in my Father's house or many mansions. I go there to what? Prepare a place for you that where I am, what? You may be also. And I come again to prepare a place for you. When you read the end of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. When you read the Gospels, Jesus said, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to heaven, but I'm coming again. And he told us exactly how he's going to come back. What is it that, that Paul says? I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. But listen, on that day, on that day, the graves will open, the eastern sky will split, the trumpet will sound, the dead will rise first, and then those who remain will be caught up with him in the air. And, and the best part is the end of it. And we shall dwell with the Lord for how long? Forever! You know, all of this had to happen so that Jesus could come back again. And he made us a promise. But make no mistake, just as there was in the days of Jesus, there are religious leaders who do not say that there is only one way to heaven and that Jesus is that way. There are those religious leaders who say Jesus is not the Son of God. There are those who say it doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe, in the end, we'll all get saved. May I tell you, just as there were the doubters, the scoffers in the day of Jesus that were the religious, as we as we call today believers and Christians, they believe, they call themselves a Christian, but not in what the Bible says. Trust me. They're here today just as they were in Jesus' day. And in Jesus' day, many people missed it. And make no mistake, today, when Jesus comes back again, there will be many people that miss it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way, no other way come to the Father, except by the Son. Jesus said, or Paul said, unless a man confess with his mouth that he is Lord, speaking to Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you cannot be saved. You know the cool part of that raised from the dead? You know what the cool part of that is? He had to be crucified. 
You know what the cool part of that is? Jesus said, I got to go to Jerusalem and I've got to be crucified. I've got to be buried so that on the third day I will rise again. And I love it. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. There's people today that don't understand it. But you know, there are some things I am willing to take by faith. May I go back to the original question that I ask you? Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking today, who do you say that I am? Maybe this morning you're here and it's time to say, Jesus is the son of God who died for my sins. And by confessing and believing, I can have an eternal life with him. Maybe today is the day for you to make the decision to follow Jesus. To come forward and let the people know to follow Jesus in baptism. To follow Jesus in finding a church home and coming to work for the mission of, of, of Jesus and what he has to the world. Maybe today is the day that it's time for you to come home to a reality of you've been living life for yourself. Over these last 11, almost 12 months, I've been living for myself and not for Jesus. And today, I'm ready to start living for Jesus. You know what excites me today is I'm ready to have an invitation today. I think today is the day that we need to tell the world, no virus can keep me away from God. No virus can keep me away from Jesus. No virus can keep me away from being the man, the woman, the girl, or the boy that God created me today to be. Today is the day that I will acknowledge that I believe in him and I will follow him. Let us pray.